It's a wonderful day, wonderful time to worship the Lord once again. So how are you? So everybody doing good? How are you up there? So it's good to see you guys uh, today. And uh, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge first the presence of our dear friend, Pastor uh, Joey Melad and his family, Sylvia, and uh, their children. So worshiping with us today, they're from uh, GCF West in Pampanga. So they're pastoring a church there. So welcome, Pastor, in our humble church. And th thank you for um, the time that we spent uh, yesterday and the other day with the fellowship and encouragement. All right. Today, oh, whoa. I'm excited to launch our new sermon series entitled A Consecrated Journey. Our theme for this year 2024 is a consecrated life. And we have started our year with the, the call to a consecrated life. And now the Lord is leading us to be consistent and live a life of consecration. And we entitled our sermon series, A Consecrated Journey. So what is a, a consecrated journey? A consecrated journey is a sacred pilgrimage, a life devoted to prioritizing what matters most to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What matters to Him? A consecrated life is intentionally lived, surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. It is a journey where prayer and obedience to God's Word as the compass directing our way. It is an ongoing process of uh, transformation, a continuous surrender, uh, surrender of, of our will to His divine purposes. Amen? So we have prepared eight sermons, eight sermons for this sermon series. And I hope and pray that as we go through this sermon series, our lives will never be the same again. So I would like you to be present as much as possible. Commit your life to the Lord, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Finish this sermon series, eight sermon that would change, I believe so, would change our lives forever. So may God bring us all to a spiritual maturity intended for us, all for the glory of his name. Amen? You know, you know, this year, uh, 2024, I'm also excited to announce also this year marks my 13th year serving in SBCF. So praise God. Praise God for His uh, sustaining, sustaining grace. So time really flies. And I remember Ian and Volts and AJ, uh, you know, they were just youth back then. Don't ask about P. Jim. He was, he was already adult back then. So, <laughs> so uh, and I'm glad that they are still with us today, serving the Lord faithfully. Faithfully. Now, is there anyone here that's, uh, who has been with us in SBCF for more than uh, or 10 years or 10 years? I would like you to raise your hands. Oh, Tita Jen is there. All right. There are quite a, a number of you. And, uh, you know, these people, you know, let's uh, first give God a clap offering for them. <laughs> so these guys persevered and stayed the course of their calling following the Lord. So it's been a decade working with them and serving God with them. And... Uh, uh, these are the faithful ones of our church. Now, speaking of faithfulness, there is also a church in the New Testament that is commended by the Apostle Paul for their steadfast devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. The church in Colossae, the, Corinth, uh, the, the uh, Colossian church. The Colossian church exemplified a consecrated life in Christ, and a particularly noteworthy aspect of their commitment was their honorable faithfulness. 
their honorable faithfulness to the Lord. The members of the Colossian church, you know, they consistently demonstrated devotion to Christ, setting them apart as a shining example of faithfulness within the early Christian communities. The title of our message today is, is Honorable Faithfulness, and our passage is found in Colossians chapter 1, verse 3 to 7. And I invite you now to stand in reverence to the reading of God's Word. Let us read together. We always pray for you and we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all God's people, which comes from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. This same good news that come to you is going out all over the world. It is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. You learned about the good news from Epaphras, our beloved co-worker. He is Christ's faithful servant, and he is helping us on your behalf. He has told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. Let's pray one more time and ask the Lord for guidance as we study his word. Father in heaven, we thank you for loving us and for bringing us together through your saving grace, through the finished work of Christ, our Lord and Savior on the cross. Now we pray that as we continue to grow in faith and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and as we desire to cultivate an intimacy uh, and growing faith in you, Holy Spirit, guide us to always understand and apply the word of God in our lives. Now speak to us today, and may you find us faithful in everything that we do, especially, Lord, our time for you, and our relationship with you. Help us to be obedient children of God as we continue to seek you and learn from you in your word. And this is our prayer in the mighty and powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Now, here's the big idea, the main idea of our passage, okay, of our message today. A consecrated life reveals faithfulness. A consecrated life, my brothers and sisters, reveals faithfulness. Let us take a look uh, at first the good news in our passage. Now, receiving good news definitely fills our hearts with joy. Yeah, we always want the, the good news, you know, while bad news tends to bring sorrow. In our passage, Paul expressed his overjoyed reaction to the positive report he received from the Colossian believers. He heard the good report, and then he responded by writing them back, and then he was overjoyed. These believers demonstrated faithfulness in living out the teaching of Christ, then prompting Paul to begin his letter with heartfelt thanksgiving to God, for the encouraging news about them. He said in verse 3, we always pray for you. And then in their prayer, they give thanks to God. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now what brought up joy to Paul's heart is when he received the good news that the Colossian believers prioritize Christ in their lives by actively living out his teaching, especially, listen, church, especially in their love for one another. In verse 4, it says, We have heard about your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all God's people. Now, Paul was rejoicing and praying to the Lord with thanksgiving because the consecrated life demonstrated by the Colossian believers was revealed through their faithfulness in Christ. 
despite the strong influence of pagan practices in their city, despite the prevalent unbelief and pagan practices, listen, their faith in Christ and love for God's people, the church, were unwavering. What a wonderful church. Now, here's the good news in our passage, my friends. The, reasons that, the reason they were able to exercise love for others is that their faith in Christ, their love for Jesus is growing. They're devoted to Jesus Christ and his, in his teachings. Their consecrated life in Christ enabled them to love others. You know, when you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, your love for others grows even more. Do you believe that? And that is very important. That's the good news Paul received about the Colossian believers. They love Jesus Christ more than ever, and their capacity to love others grows even more. Now, if you want to learn how to truly love, devote yourself to Christ and you will learn how to love unconditionally. Another important observation I could see in this passage that, that inspired the Colossian believers uh, to be faithful is their, their focus on what is eternal. In verse 5 it says, which comes from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven, which uh, the, uh, you, you, have, you had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. Now, their confident hope in God's promise of eternal life became their strong foundation for living a life pleasing to God. They knew that they were consecrated to eternal life and they understood that they belonged to God when they heard the truth of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Church, listen. In our quest to a consecrated life, a person, listen, this is very important, a person without faith, without faith in Christ does not embark on a consecrated journey. You do not have a spiritual journey if you do not have Jesus Christ in your heart. A consecrated journey begins by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, understanding that he died on the cross of Calvary to atone and pay the penalty of our sins. And you must acknowledge, we must acknowledge that we are sinners, we are not worthy before God, and we need a Savior, we need God to save us. And God demonstrated his love, you know, his God's gift of forgiveness to the Lord Jesus Christ. We must repent our sin, accept the gifts of forgiveness, and wholeheartedly surrender our lives to the Lordship of Christ. This is what it means to have faith in Christ. Their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That was their strong anchor and foundation. However, it doesn't stop there. You must continue to mature in your faith by submitting to the Lordship of Christ daily, daily in all aspects of your life. Now, the tangible outcome of this is a consecrated life characterized by growing faith in Christ and unconditional love for others. Listen, the faith, their faith in Christ and their love for God's people were anchored on the hope of eternal life through the grace of God. Wow. You know, when you focus on the hope of eternal life, when you realize that life here on earth is just temporary, it will drive you to grow deeper in love with Christ, that he is the only one who can satisfy appreciating what he has done for you on the cross. And as you grow deeper in love with him, you will love what he loves. The church, he died for the church. 
He loves the church despite our imperfection, despite our shortcomings. The Lord Jesus Christ loved his church, his body. He loves the lost souls. He loves the broken people. As you grow deep in love with him, you will grow deep in love on what Jesus Christ loves. You will learn to love Jesus unconditionally. My friends, this is the same faith, hope, and love that we should uh, that should motivate us to be to live faithfully for Jesus. Our faith in Christ, our love for others, and hope of eternal life should be affirmed. It should be affirmed through godly transformation, which leads me to my next point. You know, many people strive for change. They want to be changed. Wanting to become godly, and there's nothing wrong with that. Actually, that should be our goal, to live godly lives, because it is God's will for us. However, the sad thing is, many people seek godliness in the wrong direction. Let me tell you the truth. Listen, you cannot experience godly transformation without completely understanding, once again, the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. So in our passage, what changed the lives of the Colossian believers is the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. Let us read. Let me read it to you. This same good news that comes to you is going out all over the world. It is bear, bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives. That is the power of the gospel. Just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth of God's wonderful grace. Now, to understand this good news, we must first understand or acknowledge the bad news. There is bad news. The bad news, my friends, is everyone has sinned. Everyone. And have fallen short of God's glory, of his standard, according to Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin is death. When the Bible talks about death, it is eternal separation from God. Not just physical death, but eternal separation from God. We cannot save ourselves from that condemnation, from the condemnation of sin, and eternal punishment in hell. And this is serious. But... Here's the good news. There's good news. The good news is the free gift of God. The free gift of God is eternal life through whom? Not being religious, not good works, but through Jesus Christ our Lord. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that whoever, anyone believes in him, shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, the good news is Jesus can save us from the condemnation of sin. And he, here's another good news for you. The good news is Jesus can also transform our lives. He can transform our lives through the grace of God. And this was the good news that the Colossian believers put their hope on. You know, Jesus cannot just make you a good person. He can make you a good, he cannot just make you a good person, but he can make you a new person. That kind of transformation that he promised. Now, what do people do with this? The good news is being proclaimed all over the world in the time of Paul, and it is in our time now. It is going out all over the world. It reaches us. The good news reaches us. But the sad thing is, what do people do with this good news? Some accept it. Praise God. But many reject it. Some may pretend to have received the good news. In our passage, it says, if you receive it with clarity, the gospel of Jesus Christ, with clarity, and sincerely repented of, of, of your sins, it is bearing fruit 
everywhere by changing lives. My friends, when you heard and understood the truth of God's wonderful grace, the good news that Jesus is the Son of God, that He came to this world to die for you, to pay the penalty of your sin. If you believe in Him, if you repent of your sin and accept God's free grace, His free gift of forgiveness, the passage says it is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives. Now, my friends, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is another gift. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Wow. When you profess that you have accepted Jesus Christ in your life, my next question is, what is the evidence in your life? The evidence should be a transformed life. A new desire to dig in and study the Word of God. A new desire and passion to worship God. A new desire to commune with God in prayer. You're hungry about God and you want, him, you want to know Him more and more. And a new passion and a new found commitment to obey God in everything. Now this transformation comes from the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that lives in us, in us. You cannot change or you are not changing yourself to be good or godly because, you know, you do not have the power to do so. We cannot change ourselves. Like uh, the song, Filipino song, famous song, Gusto kong bumait pero hindi ko magawa. It is the work of the Holy Spirit changing you. Like the last message, sanctifying you through and through. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. The evidence that the Holy Spirit is seen is the fruit of the Spirit in your life. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, if you have the Spirit of God in you, there should be fruit. Coming out from you. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. You cannot attain godly transformation by merely being religious. Many people engage in religious activities such as attending Bible studies, going to church services, participating in various religious events, yet they do not experience godly transformation, something in missing, something wrong with the foundation. They may be religious, but not experiencing freedom from sin. Similarly, you cannot achieve godly transformation solely through good works. You might sell all your possessions and give it to the poor, but that alone cannot lead to godly transformation. Why? Because there's only one way to experience godly transformation, and that is through Jesus Christ. He is the one who can transform someone to a new person. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ, if you belong to Christ, has become a new person, not just a good person but a new person in the sight of God. The old is gone and the new has begun. People around you will affirm your life transformation because Jesus lives in you through the Holy Spirit. Now, from my experiences, or from my experience, I've seen plenty of people who have committed themselves to Christ experience changed lives, really changed lives. From being hot-tempered, to being self-controlled, from being materialistic to being content, from being indifferent to being highly compassionate, from being re rebellious to being pleasantly compliant, and from being overly harsh to being the epitome of gentleness. You know, in some, the change was apparent overnight. Oh, miracle, the Lord changed that person, but... 
you know, in others, Christ slowly molding or molded them over weeks, months, years. But looking back at their lives, the lives of these people, considering who they were before and after they had an encounter with Jesus Christ, they demonstrated godly transformation that comes from the wonderful grace of God. My friends, consecrated journey is a continuous process of allowing the Lord to transform us. This is a lifetime process. Lifetime journey. Faithfulness is a way to continuous transformation. It means you only live for Christ and a, com a, a commitment to live according to His will. It is a journey of growth and intimacy with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, I'd like to... I'd like us to hear a testimony of life uh, transformation. Uh, she's been my friend for more than a decade now, and I've seen how God transformed her from the first day until today. She's walking with the Lord. Let us call Kat Pantoja to share God's transforming power in her life because of the grace of God. Okay. Good morning, church. Yeah. So I was given this very last-minute opportunity to stand here today to share my testimony with all of you because apparently my video testimony, which was made eight years ago, cannot be found. But, but that's okay. I backslided many times after that video was made, so maybe that's why the Lord took it away and He wants me to share a much more updated testimony. So let me get started. Again, my name is Kat Pantoja. Today, I stand before you as a Sunday school teacher to many of your kids, a Christian for more than a decade now, and married to our praise and worship leader with two children who look adorable but can be a complete handful because they got Jackie's personality. <laughs> so when most people see my life, they see someone who has been blessed in more ways than one. I have a beautiful family, a comfortable life, an amazing church I get to call home and do ministry in, a job, and a set of pretty solid friends. But life hasn't always been this good. If someone said to me 10 or so years ago that I would be doing what I'm doing right now, standing in a pulpit and sharing about God, I would have probably laughed at them so hysterically and uncontrollably because I was high off my mind from whatever drug I was on. Yes, I threw in those terms so casually because that's exactly what I was back then. There was no way I could function without the things I was taking. I was wasting my parents' money on it. I revolved my whole life around it. I was dependent on it. And all that led to a lifestyle that consisted of a lot of partying, wasting one precious day over another, and entering into toxic relationships that was emotionally and physically abusive that it wrecked me as a person and shattered every single ounce of me as a woman. So life took a very drastic change for me when I fell in love with my drug dealer. Wow, what a love story. <laughs> I thought he was my everything. I loved him. <laughs> Deeply. And I thought that our relationship, and even though our relationship cost us, my family, my relationship with my family, I fought for it. But the abuse I received from him left scars on my body, literally. Lifelong traumas and emotional instability that I find still creeps out of me every now and then. Like when my daughter Raya tries to hug me and clings onto my neck. My initial reaction would be to push her away because I remember the hands that gripped my throat so tightly. Or in the beginning of our relationship, when my husband and I would get into fights, I would resort to physically hurting myself because that's the pain that I associated with disagreements. I, had, I also had no regards for Jesus back then because I felt that he was never with me that he didn't care enough for me when I found myself snorting and smoking whatever was available 
to mask the pain all over the body from being a punching bag to someone I gave my heart to. I hit rock bottom when the person I love stabbed me with a shard of his whiskey glass and locked me inside his room with no remorse nor sense of urgency to rush me to the nearest hospital. I resulted to mending my wound with tissue and packaging tape. But of course, that effort didn't do justice to the amount of blood that came out and the ugly scar that it left behind. At that point, I left myself go and let God take full control of the life I held on to. I surrendered my life to this God I had no regards for, let alone a relationship with. A part of me thought that God wouldn't listen to my prayer since I never really bothered to know him in the first place. But I was wrong. He listened and he instilled in my heart that he was with me and has always been by my side all this time. So my life did a complete turn and God made sure to close all the doors that would lead me back to my old ways. God has given me a life that I didn't expect to have. He gave me a life that I wasn't worthy of having. Now I still remember very vividly that night that I surrendered to God. I cried and poured my heart out as I was mending my wounds and icing my bruises. I was begging not for God to answer my desires, but for his will to be done in my life. I uttered words of despair, letting go of everything and anything that was in my heart. I was never one to read the Bible back then, but in, the, in that moment, God directed me to Proverbs 3, 5, 6, which says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will lead your path straight. So God, being the amazing God that he is, knew that I wasn't much of a Bible person, so he led me to this very simple yet very powerful verse that I took and still take to heart today. I memorized that verse that same night I surrendered to the Lord. I said it over and over and over again until I fell asleep, woke up feeling, feeling renewed and empowered to let go of the things that are not part of the Lord's plan for me. And I also prayed for better relationships. I prayed for relationship with friends and a significant other that would be centered on Christ. And lo and behold, that prayer was answered tenfold when I met Jackie who came here as a missionary, comes from a family of pastors, and has an admirable dedication to the Lord, which God used to also help me with my walk. And on a side note, when Jackie and I first met, I prayed and asked the Lord to make it obvious if this was the relationship he has set out for me. And goodness, did God make it obvious. So, <laughs> yep. I found out a few weeks after meeting Jackie that his life verse is the same verse God used to comfort me, and that same verse I still live by today. Still gives me goosebumps now that I think about it. So talk about the ways of God, right? He has indeed led me to a much straighter path. Not just through Jackie, but also this church. So in the end, even in my very selfish ways, God remained extremely faithful. He never abandoned me and instead gave me a way to get through the pins and needles of my life. Because of his love and generosity, I have dedicated my life to loving and serving him. My testimony, though it sounds shameful, is something I share very freely with people because I want, I want you guys to know the transforming power of Christ to those who wholeheartedly surrenders to him. What was once a broken woman with no integrity and full of shame now stands before all of you proclaiming how's the, how the Lord has worked in my life. Proud to be called a child of God. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Kat, for, for sharing uh, that wonderful, life-changing uh, testimony. God's power, transforming power in your life. You know, my friends, in, li uh, in line with Kat's testimony, no, we cannot experience godly transformation unless Jesus Christ lives in you. You cannot experience joy and true satisfaction in life unless Christ fills that void in your heart. You cannot experience peace beyond human comprehension 
unless Christ is enthroned in your heart. Surrender your life to Jesus Christ and fulfill his purposes in your life. And then you will experience life transformation, godly transformation, and you will become a genuine servant of Christ, which leads me to my last and final point. Are you still there? Are you still with me? All right. In verse 7, it says, You learn about the good news from Epaphras, our beloved co-worker. He is Christ's faithful servant, and he is helping us on, on your behalf. He has told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. In, a, in, in this passage, Paul included a commendation for Epaphras. Now, who is Epaphras? Now, according to our passage, he was a beloved co-worker. He was serving Christ back then. But his name sounds Greek, right? He wasn't a Jew. So, and, and Christ's faithful servant, he was a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, it is indicated in our passage that Epaphras voluntarily set aside his personal desire in order to love, serve, and obey the will of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, he was truly faithful disciple. You know, it's good to see that there was a spirit-filled brother in Christ who cared so much for the spiritual uh, well-being of his home church. Epaphras. Now, Epaphras was not a theologian like Paul was. But he was able to lead people to the saving grace of God. How? Because of his faithfulness in Christ. He walked with Christ. He served Christ. He loved Christ. He surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. He demonstrated a changed life and a genuine love for others. He exemplified love and faithfulness to his home church, the Colossian church. Now, I remember Phil's testimony before God uh, called him uh, to the ministry. He grew up as a church, uh, you know, as a bench warmer Christian. So a bench warmer Christian is a term used to describe someone who identifies as a Christian, but is not actively involved or engaging in the ministry. The term draws an analogy from sports where, you know, bench warmer is a player who spent most of his time on the bench, not actively participating in the game. Now, similarly, okay, a bench warmer Christian may be inactive in attending church, participating in spiritual activities, or living out uh, the Christ uh, teachings in their daily life. So a bench warmer Christian, my dear brothers and sisters, is not a good role model in the Christian faith and in fulfilling God's great purposes for them. Do you agree? So don't look at your neighbor. All right? So as BCF Church, we need to be faithful servants of Christ like Epaphras. Like Epaphras in our community who can also make a difference. A layman leader, a Christian, not a theologian, a believer. We need a Christian who has compassion to bring the good news to the lost souls. We need a Christian who has compassion for his community for his home church, we need a Christian who walks the talk, who demonstrated unconditional love, unconditional love for others. We need a Christian whose heart is to serve Christ faithfully. Perhaps you are that Epaphras in SBCF. You are that Epaphras, and I'd like to challenge you to step up and be a good role model of love and faithfulness in your home church. 
step up like Epaphras. Love your church. Love people around. Because we are all called to be genuine servants of Christ. As Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Are you still with me? So as I conclude my message, I encourage you, my brothers and sisters, to be faithful in your consecrated journey with the Lord by making him the highest priority in your life. Fall in love in Jesus deeper. Because your faithfulness in the Lord would produce godly transformation. In other words, just persevere. Be faithful in God. Now this year, I'd like to challenge you though. I'd like to challenge you to be faithful in sharing the good news to others. I challenge you to just bring one soul to Jesus this year. Can you do that? Just one soul in 365 days. One soul for the Lord. And in that one soul, the heaven rejoices if that one soul is saved. Angels are rejoicing. Bring one soul to Christ this year. If you can do more, even better. Amen? Just reach out to that one person. Pray for them. Share the good news with them. Spend time with them. Love them. And then guide them how to grow in their faith in Christ. Now, through our consecrated life in Christ, I hope and pray that in the process, in the process, my brothers and sisters, this church, God's church, Jesus Christ Church, I hope and pray that people around us, like the Colossian believers, people around us will praise the name of Jesus Christ because they see the love abounding in our midst. Godly transformation is happening in our lives and genuine servants of Christ are being developed among us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Did you get the message, my brothers and sisters? Remember, a consecrated life reveals faithfulness. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for, for being with us this morning. Thank you for reminding us your grace and your love that only in your name we can attain a transformed life by surrendering our lives to you fully. We thank you, Lord, because from the beginning, you are at work in your church, saving and changing people's lives. And it reaches us, this wonderful grace of God. And may you speak to our hearts, speak to your people, speak to individual, O oh God, to treasure this wonderful grace of God. Because we believe that this is the key to a transform, godly transformation and becoming a genuine servant, disciples of Jesus Christ who can make a deeper difference in our homes, in our communities, in our country and the world. Bless your church as PCF as we desire in this journey to have a consecrated life. Cover us, protect us, guide us, and help us to continue to grow. We lift up to you our sermon series, O God, these eight sermons. As we study and dig in and proclaim the Word of God, change us through and through, sanctify us through and through to the working power of the Holy Spirit because your Word is true and your Word sanctifies us as the prayer of Jesus Christ. Sanctify us, your Word, through this sermon series, a consecrated journey in Jesus name amen amen in the next two minutes let us quietly reflect on God's message that was shared with us today and answer the following questions